Hello and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini, the Executive Director of the Radcliffe Fellowship Program at Harvard University. It is my pleasure to introduce today's talk by Radcliffe Fellow Emil Keme, who has been called the foremost Kiche Maya scholar in literary and cultural studies. His most recent monograph, The Maya Katsikr, Our Maya World, Poetics of Resistance in Guatemala, won Cuba's prestigious Premio Literario Casa de las Americas in 2020. The book interweaves the poetry and literary imagination of modern Maya writer with the social and political climate of Guatemala between 1960 and 2012. Emil is an active acting professor of English at Emory University. His research centered on, indige on indigenous intellectuals writing against established narratives of power in indigenous world. Emil's fellowship project is an expansion of a 2018 trilingual Quiche Maya Spanish English scholarly essay entitled For Abi Ayala to Live, the Americas Must Die. Abi Ayala, which for many indigenous activists and scholars represent the original name of the Americas, is a term and framework for indigenous solidarity that has been in use since 1975. It derives from the indigenous original and ancestral name of the Americas. Emil will use it as a category to explore indigenous struggles for self-determination with a focus on connecting across hemispheres. When time allows it, Emil finds pleasure in salsa and bachata dancing. He thinks that dancing is one of the best medicine for the mind, body, and soul, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Emil, actually the floor and virtual floor to Emil Keme. Thank you. Maltios, Maltios Claudia. Um, speak ich that, speak ich nan, um, speak ich evangel, lenubi are emil keme, inach kichimaya winak, papa shilkayala inalashinak, we inach pamusmus, shukuhe inach shelahuk noch, inko warali wuk, chwechwek ech, chwechwe saak, chuyaik le nukas nemahim, nubinem, Kinkamuwah, Kamula Shmul, Chetri, Ukush Kah, Ri Ukush Uleu, Rumachi, Uyambe, Inkowaral. What you just heard is the Kiche Maya language, which is one of 31 indigenous Maya languages spoken in the Mesoamerican region and increasingly in many parts in Turtle Island or North America. I said, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Kame. I am an indigenous Kiche Maya person. My umbilical cord is buried in a place called Momostenango and also in Quetzaltenango, in Ishimuleo, or Guatemala. And I am very happy to be here with all of you. I am grateful to the heart of the sky and the heart of Earth for allowing us the opportunity to come together to have this conversation. I would also like to take this opportunity to honor and recognize the homelands of the Massachusetts people. As an indigenous Quiche Maya immigrant, I am grateful to the generations of peoples that have taken care of these lands for thousands of years. Today is also a very important day for indigenous peoples. On October 12, 1492, our resistance against European invasions begins. I would like to invoke the words of Nana Dolores Cacuango, who, is an, uh, who was an indigenous Quichua activist uh, that fought for the rights of indigenous peoples in Ecuador. She said the following about indigenous peoples and, and resistance. We are like the grass of the mountain that grows back again after being cut. And as mountain grass, we will cover the world. In that spirit, I would like to dedicate my presentation today to my ancestors because their struggles and sacrifices opened a path for me. I would also like to dedicate this presentation to the land defenders of today because their struggles represent an inspiration. Um, all right, to begin with, let me bring your attention to a recent study that was published by the World Bank on the state of the environment 
In this study, they highlight through this graph how indigenous peoples are protecting 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. The specific quote that comes from this study is the following. Despite the fact that indigenous peoples make up 15% of the world's extreme poor and just 5% of the global population, they are protecting 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. I mean, no pressure, right? Yeah. <laughs> that only 5% of the world population is protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity. And I am sure that the question that uh, is going to your minds right now is like, well, how are indigenous peoples doing that? And if we think of this hemisphere of Abiyala, you're going to find that we are putting our bodies on the streets in order to defend the sacred, in order to defend Mother Earth. Some of you may be familiar with this image. It is from the water protectors in the Standing Rock Indian Reservation who are protesting the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline, a $4 billion project to build a 1,200-mile pipeline that would carry half a, a million uh, barrels of oil a day through four different states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Illinois, and under the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. From the perspective of the water protectors, if that pipeline breaks and oil spills on the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, more than 11 million people are going to be affected by not having access to clean water. We know the importance of having access to clean water, right? We can ask people in Detroit, in California, in Colorado. If we go a little bit to the north, in 2012, we have the Idol No More movement, a movement that emerged in, among indigenous uh, among First Nations in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. So on the, in this year, on the, on, in, 2020, in 2012, sorry, the Canadian government removed environmental protection laws from its constitution. And uh, basically giving a green light to companies to enter into territories and extract resources. So First Nations said that by removing those environmental protection laws, First Nations sovereignty and their lands are going to be in danger. And they were absolutely right. They are absolutely right on this. Because as, uh, if you can do a Google search on the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, you're going to find how they are struggling against loggers, uh, companies trying to enter the territory and cut trees, right? If we go to the south, to southern Mexico, you're going to find the Zapatista Army of National Liberation a Mayan-led movement that emerged in 1994. On December of um, 1993, the Mexican government signed the North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada and the United States. And uh, on January 1st, the Zapatistas emerged um, and declared war against the Mexican settler nation, nation state, saying that neoliberalism is a death sentence to indigenous peoples. Similar to what happened in Canada, Mexico removed from its constitution Article 27, which is a, an article that protected communal indigenous land holdings, the so-called ejido land system. And um, so basically giving green light to, to transnational companies to enter territories and extract resources from indigenous lands. And uh, the major threat that the Zapatistas are uh, facing right now uh, has to do with the so-called Maya train, a multi-billion dollar project sponsored by the Mexican government to build a high-speed train in southern Mexico to connect um, several Mayan ancestral sites and allow tourists to travel from the Yucatan Peninsula all the way to the state of Chiapas. According from Mayan activists and land protectors, um, they are saying that this project is already destroying a lot of Maya sacred sites. And uh, it is going to bring a lot of environmental damage to the region, okay? And if we go down all the way to the south, if you open a newspaper in Colombia, in Guatemala, in Chile, in Argentina right now, you're going to find 
similar movements to that of the Zapatistas, the water protectors, and I don't know more. And for defending the sacred, we're paying the price. And it is alarming that in the last decade, you know, many land defenders, many water protectors are being criminalized by these settler colonial governments, you know, driving a lot of these activists to go into exile, or they are being uh, put in jail. Um, and in many cases, they have died. And these are just 19 faces of some of the activists, some of the land protectors we have lost in the last uh, 10 years. But there are hundreds, hundreds, we, we've been losing hundreds. Just a couple of days ago, I saw a post on Instagram from, from a Yanomami elder uh, and his son that uh, were protecting Yanomami territory and they were killed by cold prospectors. So this is happening every day and it's alarming. We have to be aware of this. And with that in mind, I would like to bring into this conversation today the wisdom of Devi Kopenawa Yanomami, a Yanomami elder, a land defender, uh, one of our heroes in Abi Ayala. Um, his testimony, his wisdom, was recorded by a French anthropologist whose name is Bruce Albert. Bruce Albert lived among the Yanomami for many years and became friends with Abi Kopenawa, and, uh, and they recorded, uh, Bruce Albert recorded his wisdom in, in the Yanomami language, and then went back to France, transcribed the, uh, the, the manuscript, and translated it to French. The first edition of the book was published in French in 2010. It was later translated to English in 2013 and published by Harvard University Press. And in 2015, we have the Portuguese version of the book. So as you can see, it is uh, a book that has reached wider audiences beyond Brazil, and uh, it, it is a book that is being widely read and discussed. Um, but before I get to tell you a little bit more about this book and Davi Kopenawa, I should tell you about the Yanomami. Some of you may not know about them. So these are their homelands. They are located uh, in present-day Venezuela and Brazil. On the Brazilian side, the Yanomami represent one of 305 indigenous nations. In Brazil, there are 274 indigenous languages that are spoken today. On the Venezuelan side, the Yanomami represent one of 31 indigenous nations. The size of their homelands uh, are sort of like the size of the state of Indiana, so you can have a better idea. Their population today, according to the last census of 2020, uh, is about 40, 45,000, okay? Um, the stories I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to be sharing with you from David Kopenawa come from his community. It's called Watoriki, the Windy Mountain. It's this village. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, place full of life. And um, I should now tell you a little bit more about David Kopenawa in case you're not familiar with his work. So David Kopenawa is a page or a wise elder, a very well-respected elder in his community. Uh, a memory that he shares with us through his book is that uh, when he was two years old, religious missionaries and garimperos or gold prospectors entered his community. He was born in a community near Rio Torototobo uh, in, uh, in Yanomami territory. So these religious missionaries and gold prospectors entered Yanomami territory and, they, uh, and unfortunately they spread uh, diseases missiles, and many Yanomami people died, including his father, his biological father. His mother, to protect him, put him in a basket and hid him in the forest. And he says, wow, the forest saved my life, right? And uh, so his mother had to move to a different community and she, was, uh, and she remarried. And uh, the first lessons about the importance of the forest and the importance of defending that forest and the Yanomami people came from his stepfather, right? And uh, in, 19, in the 1980s, there was also a massacre of many Yanomami people. And that's when uh, Kopenawa decided to become more active with his work, denouncing what was happening in Yanomami territory. He was able to learn Portuguese. 
he became an interpreter um, and uh, between an interpreter that uh, worked for this indigenous organization that was part of the government. And, uh, and that experience was very important for Copenhagen because he says, I learned the way white people think about us and our forest. And, uh, and based on that, he also made the decision to narrate uh, the stories of the Yanomami people because he says, well, maybe white people are destroying the forest and they are destroying us because they don't know anything about us. But what if, what if I share our wisdom? What if I share the fact that the forest for us is a relative? Maybe, and just maybe, they will stop killing us and they will stop destroying the forest. So it is a very compelling argument, right, that is worth sharing with the world. And, uh, and so this is him um, talking about uh, the forest. And uh, also something I forgot to mention is that in 2004, um, Kopenawa also founded a Yanomami organization uh, called the Hutukara Asusa Sound Yanomami, which is the organization that sort of um, offers information about what's going on in the Amazonia and the Yanomami people. Um, if you wanna know more about David Kopenawa, you can just go to Google put his name or YouTube and a lot of, a lot of his interviews, uh, because he has been able to travel around the world, uh, uh, raising consciousness about what's going on in the Amazonia. If you have uh, Netflix, uh, you're, you're going to find this documentary called Ultima Foresta, or The Last Forest. It's really good. And a lot of the stories that uh, Copenawa narrates in this documentary come from the book The Falling Sky. Now, before I tell you uh, more about David Kopenawa, I should also mention a few things regarding this book and uh, David Kopenawa. First of all, there are many uh, debates around this book. The first one has to do with the translation, uh, the English translation of the book. Some people are not happy with the translation. Um, I was able to compare uh, the English translation to that of the French and Portuguese. I like it. I think it's good. So for me, it's no issue, but I can understand some of those discussions. I don't, I don't have time to go into depth about them right now. The other uh, controversy has to do with the figure of Kopenawa. Some people have even said that what we get, the testimony that we get in this book is not really the authentic voice of David Kopenawa. It's actually Bruce Albert, the French anthropologist that came into Yanomami territory and brainwashed David. Right? And, and so what we're actually getting is the voice of Bruce Albert. If you compare what's in this book to some of the interviews that he has given in public, you immediately realize that that's BS, <laughs> okay? Anyways, but those discussions are out there. And the other uh, controversy has to do with the Yanom Yanomami people as a whole. So there was this anthropologist whose name was um, Napoleon Chagon, who uh, wrote a number of studies on the Yanomami people, and the way he represented them was that uh, the Yanomami were warlike people that were only interested in destroying other tribes in the Amazonia region in order to take possession of the whole Amazon. Uh, he also suggested that they were savages, that they didn't like outsiders, and if outsiders came close to Yanomami territory, they would kill them. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, and then later there was another anthropologist that published a different account of, of, the, of the Yanomami. Um, the name of this anthropologist is Patrick Tierney, and he wrote a book called Darkness in El Dorado, challenging uh, Chagon's assumptions and uh, representation of the Yanomami. And this created a whole debate about the role of anthropology and indigenous peoples. And a book was published uh, on this discussion. If you're interested in learning more, you can send me an email and I can share the, the sources with you. All right, finally, <laughs> we get to the best part. So, David Kopenawa says that the Amazonian rainforest represent the lungs of Mother Earth. All I'd like us to take a minute for us to imagine being in that part of the world. Imagine a sea of green, 
in a day like today, which is sunny, it's beautiful, right? And then as you enter that forest, you're welcomed by a concert of sounds. We get to hear birds, like parakeets, toucans. We get to hear spider and howler monkeys. We get to hear snakes. If it is about to rain, then we hear frogs, cicadas. We get to hear the sound carries in the trees. The air, that sound of the air and the trees, right, which is so beautiful. What other sounds do you imagine hearing? What other sounds do you, do you imagine emanating from the rainforest? Anybody? Any other sounds that you can hear? Absolutely, rivers, running water, yes. Anything else? Yes, the wind, uh-huh. Anything else? Rain, yes, yes. One time I did this activity in one of my classes and one of the students uh, raised his hand. He was like, penguins, there are penguins there. <laughs> and I'm like, not quite, <laughs> but I would love to live in the forest that you're imagining. That was my response, because uh, I love penguins. <laughs> so um, from the perspective of Devi Kapunawa, that forest was created by Omama. So in the beginning of time, there were two brothers, Omama and Yoasi. And uh, the sky had fallen and created the earth and the forest. And so the two brothers were like, you know, navigating the forest. And then they said to each other, we need more people in this forest. So Omama copulated with Yoasi's leg. The leg became pregnant and a baby boy was born. His name was Pirimari, the first ancestor, our first ancestor, right? And one day, Pirimari is really hungry. He's a baby, and he's crying. He's hungry and thirsty. And then Omama is like, uh, hmm, I have to give you some food. I don't know what to do. And he decides to open a hole on the earth, and all this water comes out. And suddenly, there are rivers, there are lakes, there is the ocean. And he's able to get some fish from the water, and, uh, and, and is able to, uh, to, to feed Pirimari, right? And the next day he comes back to the river in order to get more food for his son. And there is this beautiful creature comes out of the river. She's half woman, half fish. Her name is Paonakare. She is the daughter of Teperisiki, the anaconda ancestor, the anaconda, the master of the rivers. And uh, so Omama and Paonakare fall in love, and they give birth to the Yanomami people, right? And um, Teperisiki, Paonakare's dad, he's very happy with this and brings gifts and says to the two of them and the Yanomami people that they can survive in the forest by you know, fishing or getting food from the forest, right? Now Yoaz, he sees all of this and he says, he gets jealous, right? And so he begins to invoke evil spirits. And he also invokes death. And obviously when this happens, Omama gets really upset and he gets into a fight with Yoazi. And Yoazi end, ends up moving to the underworld. And from there is where he sends all these diseases and death, right? So when this happens, um, Omama calls his son, Pirimari. He says, come on, let me take you out for a beer. I need to talk to you. They go to this Irish bar. In the, I'm, I'm just joking. Don't believe everything I say. Um, so he says, well, you, know, you have to learn to protect the forest, Omama says to Pirimari. He says, you have to learn the language of the trees, of the animals, right? And uh, in order to do that, you have to take, or you have to learn to drink the yaguana. So the yaguana is this powder that is made with the uh, virola tree, and then it is uh, blown into somebody's nose, um, and it has this psychoadelic effect that uh, uh, allows you to see the spirits of the forest, right? And so Pirimari is able to do that, 
he builds a house for the spirits in his chest, right? And, uh, and Omama says to him, so now that you have learned to do this, you have to teach the Yanomami people how to do it as well. So that way they can survive in the forest, right? And he says, okay, Dad, I'll do it. And he's able to begin teaching the Yanomami, the Yanomami people how to do it. And once he completes his task, he turns into the planet Venus. And uh, so Kopenawa says that Pirimari is the one that teaches the Yanomami how to use the Yakohana. And so it is a tradition that is thousands of years old. Since the beginning of the forest, the Yanomami people have been doing this in order to communicate with the forest, right? And he talks about how he came into becoming a Pache or a wise elder. And he says that in the beginning when he was little, he used to have all these nightmares, right? Uh, all these images that he would have and he would wake up screaming, crying, shaking. His, his parents didn't know what to do. Uh, it was later when he became older that, um, you know, uh, he was already living in his community of um, Watariki, and he was in his hammock, and suddenly he woke up crying and scared. And his father-in-law, whose name is Lorival, saw, saw him react, and he said, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. And he said, I've been having these dreams. And Lorival, who was a respected elder in his community, said, don't worry about it. It is, it is the spirits of the forest trying to communicate with you. I'll teach you. And so he begins to, uh, to teach him how to uh, use the yakoana. And he has to, to do all of these sacrifices. He has to live in the forest for months, just surviving, just taking the yakoana. And he loses a lot of weight. His wife is like, dude, you got to eat something. Otherwise, you're going to die. She said it that way, like, dude, you have. So um, he says, no, 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 it, you know, I'm, I'm learning. I'm, you know, I'm learning about the spirits. And so at one point, he's in the forest, and he, he dies. He says that he actually died. But that was the moment when he was able to, to, to appreciate all the spirits that were visiting him, the animal ancestors, the spirits from the wind, the trees. And they usually came with uh, singing songs and playing all these beautiful songs from the forest. And then when that happened, the figure of a mama came to visit him as well and said, you're ready. And that's when he came back to life. And, uh, and he realized that he had already built a house for the Shapiri or the spirits of the forest in his chest, right? And this was so important for him because this is how the Yanomami people know which plants to use in order to help other Yanomami people who get sick in the forest, or how to treat a tree, or how to harvest certain plants in order to grow healthy in the forest, right? And uh, the point that he makes, too, about um, that relationship that he developed with the forest, he says every human, we all, all humans have that ability to connect uh, with the environment, with nature. And he talks about his son. His, uh, his son goes through the same process, having nightmares, and he says, the Shapiri, or the spirits of the forest, are trying to communicate with you. And, uh, and he begins to teach him, but then suddenly he travels to the city to get an education, and when he comes back to the forest, he loses the connection, right? And then it is his daughter. Uh, his daughter goes through the same process, having the dreams and nightmares. And she says, uh, you know, the spirits are trying to communicate with you. And she gets really excited. And she's like, I want to be like you, that I want to be an elder. But then she falls in love. And she loses that connection. Right? And uh, so like that reflection made me think of a poem by a, a Kanjobal Maya poet from Guatemala. Oh, he's, this is Davi. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to show this. So Daniel Cañó, who's a Canjo Valmaya poet, wrote a beautiful poem that sort of invoked what David Copenhagen was saying about the, that relationship that we have with nature, right? And the, the title of this poem is um, um, Lost Sensibility. And it says, the little boy speaks with his cat and dog. He speaks with the butterflies, the bees, the plants, and the flowers. 
he speaks with the moon and the stars. When he grows older, all of this seems ridiculous to him. I ask myself, how, when, and where did he lose his sensibility? I mean, that's a very profound question. It seems like a very simple question, but it's very profound, right? And I encourage you to think about that. When, what, I mean, what, when is that moment when we lose that connection, right? What is that process like? And um, so anyways, homework for you guys to do tonight or something. <clears throat> um, I am sure not, that now you're also wondering about the Shapiri and uh, the, the spirits of the forest and the way Kopenawa describes them. It's like my favorite part of the book. He provides us with all of this beautiful uh, imagery, luminous imagery of the Shapiri, uh, who are the primordial image beings, right? The Shapiri Pe, the spirits of those beings. And the way he describes them is like, these are images of our ancestors, you know, images like water, uh, images from the water, the earth, the air, the animals and everything. And uh, he says also that uh, these are spirits from a distant forest that come and visit you, right? And they share messages with you. And, uh, and he makes the emphasis that these spirits, the Shapiripe, are the true owners of nature, not us, the spirits of the forest, right? He also says that um, uh, when they appear to you, they are very well dressed, wearing feathers, and they come uh, to you singing songs, the songs of the forest, right? And um, uh, what else does he say there? <laughs> and they come from every direction. They travel to the sky, to the earth, and they are the ones that are protecting that forest and the Yanomami people, right? And he makes an emphasis on the songs as well, which are, they, they come singing songs. And usually it's like the sounds of the trees, the birds, right? Um, and, um, and so like the, the Pache, when these images appear to them, they have to imitate the sounds and the dances because they are dancing for you. So they are trying to, to communicate with you. And, uh, and the Shapiri spirits get very happy when you do that, right? And so the, image, the images that he offers us are so beautiful. Like he says of the Shapiri, they are like tiny, uh, like uh, luminous flecks of dust, right? Or they are like stars moving through the forest. Can we see stars moving through the forest? Can you, can you see that? It's beautiful, right? Uh, or they leave path, paths of brilliant light and they are thin as spider webs floating in the air. Another beautiful image. Uh, he also says that they come with songs, right? And uh, there is one that I'm, like, my favorite one is the last one. Uh, this one, where he says that the Shapiri float gently in place like a flight of hummingbirds and bees, right? And in literary studies, what we do is like we explore the, the figurative language of a speaker, a poet, a writer. And what we look at is the type of metaphors. And as you can see, I mean, there is like visual metaphors, tactile. You can smell things. You can touch things. You can feel things, right? So it is a full experience, a connection, like a ceremony between the Paiche, the uh, elder, and the forest, right? Uh, and so all of these images made me think of the work of um, indigenous Inga artist, Carlos Hakanamihoy. He lives in Colombia. And um, through his work, he tries to represent the life of the Andean forest. This is some of his work. And as I was reading the descriptions that David Copenhagen was providing for us about the Shapiri, this is what I was thinking about. Right? This came to mind. Really beautiful work, full of color, and yeah, it's amazing. So anyways, just to conclude then, I want to share with you David Kopenawa's uh, perspective because it demonstrates 
that uh, a strong relationship that he develops with the forest, right? It is a perspective in which the forest and all of its living expressions are relatives, and that uh, how the Yanomami are able to connect with it and, uh, and live with it in a balanced way, right? And this is so important for us to keep in mind in order for people to understand how indigenous peoples relate to their environment. We have that close connection with the water, with the earth, and we are even willing to sacrifice our lives for it. So this is just one of many perspectives if you read about the, uh, the Neh or the Mohawk people or Cherokee, you're gonna find similar stories about the connection, the sacred connection that we have with, with the land and all of its living expressions. And then it's important for us to keep that in mind because as I said in the beginning, many land defenders are being killed. If you would like to learn more about the indigenous peoples in the Amazon, these are some sites of indigenous-led organizations that are working for the rights of indigenous peoples and the forest. Okay? And to conclude, I would like to acknowledge um, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard, my research partners, and the people that helped me put together this presentation. Sibalak Maltiosh, thanks so much. Emil. Sure. So the first one is, how can indigenous descendant people who grew up in environments with uh, no access to forests and nature, mm -hmm. I mean, there is always access to nature somehow, but the forest specifically, can reconnect with uh, this part of their heritage? Uh, I mean, I would say that the, the very first thing you have to do is become informed about the land that you're living in um, and uh, learn about the, because you know, throughout this hemisphere, throughout Ayala is indigenous land. So I think the very least that one can do is learn about the indigenous peoples from that specific land where you're living on and see what they are doing in order to, uh, uh, like to protect the environment and if, uh, if it is a person from a specific nation that's, uh, let's say, you know, a Cherokee person that lives in uh, Seattle or something, that person has to, to and, and if that person has lost that connection with uh, his or her or their nation, they have to learn and reconnect with it. Something that David Kapanawa narrates, for example, is that when he has traveled around the world giving uh, talks about the Yanomami people and the forest, when he comes back, he notices that a lot of the spirits that he had connected previously had left them. And so he has to do the ceremony, like take the Yakuana again in order to bring them back. So um, I think that's, that's the way to, to do it, like becoming inform about the specific traditions and uh, speak to the leaders of the communities and, and learn from them and, and they, they can offer guidance on that, on that path. Um, the next question is, what impact do you hope to have, actually to leave on the Harvard community this year, particularly regarding indigenous environmental consciousness? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> like, uh, so I already been trying to connect with people here and just learn uh, of, from their struggles and uh, learn about what's going on in this uh, region. Uh, the work that I also do with uh, the International Mayan League is about connecting with uh, indigenous peoples in the diaspora. And so I've been trying to reach out to, to organizations and community leaders in order to learn more. And so. It's like wherever I go, I'm trying to, to try to, to connect in order to learn. Because the, the purpose, the, the reason why I'm here too, like working on this project on Abiyala is because that I feel that uh, indigenous communities from the South and the North are so disconnected. We don't know much about each other and I think we, we really need to learn from one another. And in order to create bridges that can lead us to uh, potential alliances, uh, because as, as I mentioned in the beginning, right, like the, the struggles of First Nations in Canada or in the United States in relation to those in Brazil are very similar, 
right? And I think those conversations need to happen in order to determine how we can be better um, uh, work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So following up, I guess, on, on, the, on the last question is, um, how is this presentation related to your book projects about Abhi Ayala? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a small section in which I'm trying to highlight that specific relationship between indigenous peoples in the land and why it is important for us to defend it. And the fact that we're fighting to defend Mother Earth, but it's not only a, an indigenous struggle, it is an, a struggle that has to involve all of us, right? And hopefully that, uh, and hopefully that not only 5% of the world population can be defending that 80% of the remaining biodiversity, but we can find allies and accomplices that can, can work with us on that. How can concept of indigenous legal traditions be used to shape national legal frameworks to protect the environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see with some people that are becoming invo involved in, in politics, uh, you know, not only in the US, but also in Canada or other places, that that is like one of the first items that they bring into the agenda when they talk about legal processes is the question of the environment, mm -hmm. the question of climate change, and, and the fact that indigenous peoples, indigenous leaders have to be at the table for those conversations and create a specific laws. Uh, and we saw it like with Standing Rock, you know, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez going um, to uh, support uh, indigenous leaders in Standing Rock, the water protectors, and uh, also writing the, uh, the new Green Deal for, uh, as a proposal. So, I mean, that's a, a step forward, but then politicians have to make decisions that can support initiatives like that. But even, um, and, that's, and that's just like how, polit how politicians sometimes connect with indigenous peoples and in order to produce something. But there are also indigenous proposals that are, um, are being put together and are being discussed. And I can think of the Red Nation, for example, writing the, the so-called Red Deal. And they published a really wonderful book that I highly recommend, um, like offering the solutions from native nations and, you know, about climate change and all of that. Yeah. Um... Again, I guess following up on what you just said, how do you see the future of indigenous people in this globalized world? Mm -hmm. I'm very optimistic about it. A lot of people have this dystopian vision of the future, but like reading people like Davi Kopenawa or other indigenous writers, even though we criticize uh, settler colonialism, we're very optimistic that you know, we're going to overcome a lot of the challenges that we're facing. And I see us dancing salsa. <laughs> Have you explored similarities between uh, the way the Yonomami relate to their environment to other indigenous spiritual traditions uh, in other parts of the hemisphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so I was thinking about, uh, because Kopenawa talks about hero twins, like uh, uh, Yoazi and Umama. And, uh, and like the, the idea of hero twins appear in many creation stories, including like the Kiche Maya creation story, that there are two brothers that fight the lords of the underworld in order to plant the first seed of corn that is going to be used to create humanity out of corn. That's why we like to eat tortillas and, and a lot of corn in Mesoamerica. So it's, uh, uh, there are some similarities, but there are also significant differences. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's precisely what I'm interested in, in exploring in my work, also like, you know, looking at different creation stories. Because the other thing, the other challenge that we have is that a lot of people think of us as being very homogeneous, that there is no difference in our worldviews. And so I think it's very important for people to understand that the experience of the Yanomami is similar yet different from those of uh, the Zapatistas or the Maya people in Mexico, or the Mohawk Nation, right? Or, uh, so I think it's very important in order to challenge those um, assumptions about indigeneity as well. So talking about languages for a moment, that mm -hmm. you touched upon it at the beginning of the talk. What do you think about the UNESCO Decade of Indigenous Languages, which launched this year? Mm -hmm. It is wonderful. Um, I do hope that they follow it up by supporting a lot of initiatives uh, for indigenous language revitalization, because there are over 1,000 indigenous languages that are spoken in this hemisphere. And, uh, and we need all kinds of support in order to produce materials 
uh, create apps, you know, because uh, a lot of these languages are endangered. And, um, and we need to create the basis to support indigenous communities working to revitalize the languages. So I hope that uh, it doesn't stop by just recognizing indigenous languages, but also creating initiatives and laws to, to, uh, you know, to, to include these languages in, in the curriculum uh, so the new generations can, can learn them. Mm -hmm. Is the creation of the story of Amami and Yoazi something that is passed down to children today? Yeah, among the Anamami, everybody, everybody knows it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah, and there are some differences in like that's like what I offered today was the version of David Kopenawa, mm -hmm. and the one that he narrates in the documentary that I cited, The Last Forest, is is a little bit different. It's kind of similar, but it's also different. So it's you know, it's we're talking about oral traditions and. Uh, and if I came back here to, uh, if I were to come back here tomorrow and I was to retell the story, it would probably be different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it changes. But yes, in, in essence, Omama at least is the, uh, is, is the, uh, the framer, the creator of the forest. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about uh, literary war structures and how they inform your engagement with environmental advocacy and indigeneity? I'm sorry, can you repeat? How do you feel literary work structure informs your engagement with environmental advocacy and indigeneity? Literary structure? Literary, yeah, literary work structures. Mm -hmm. um, so literature, I think it's uh, an important foundation. Uh, it's so creative and allows us to, to, to use language in a very creative way. Like for example, the images of the Shapiri pay that I was sharing with you, you know, offering us uh, a close relationship you know, uh, between the Yanomami and the forest. So using that in order to better understand in a, in a creative human way, uh, those experiences, I, I think the, uh, the genre of literature really offers uh, a lot of paths that uh, can allow one to explore the way language is used in different ways and um, for social justice or, um, uh, you know, uh, or for the rights of indigenous peoples in general. So how do you see your work impacting the global effort to support indigenous community that are stewarding natural mm -hmm. resources? Well, what are you hoping right. to? Well, I, I hope that they're listening. <laughs> and um, yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm open to conversations and, uh, and hopefully, you know, like, uh, what I shared today about land defenders can be can resonate among other people, and and you know they can become aware of what's going on, um, and hopefully you know join us in that struggle, right? Like to to fight for for Mother Earth and and land defenders. So can you share some calls to actions that uh, would support indigenous people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a big one. Um, so, I mean, the struggles that I talked about today are uh, specific struggles, but I bet you anything that wherever you live, uh, and if you're living in this hemisphere, you're going to find a specific struggle. Uh, I encourage people to learn first uh, on the place where they live, to learn the history of that place and, and what kinds of struggles are taking place there. We all know that uh, we are in an emergency and that you know, we're fighting to defend um, the life of the planet and, and our own survival. And so, and there are many organizations, they don't necessarily have to be indigenous, but uh, just becoming involved, you know, making calls and say, you know, I'm a scholar and how can I help? And, and they will tell you, people will tell you. So I would say, like, start locally, like what's happening in your own community and, and begin making the connections with the people that are going to the streets or writing about these issues and, and, and see how you can connect and support those communities. Because we, I mean, we don't expect anything from government, so it, is, it has to be on us. And there is a question about the Yomamami you know, specifically. How an uh, organization who wants to help the Yomamami know, indigenous should proceed to strong their cosmovision and not weakening it? So mm -hmm. how do you go about you know, improving, not improving, but uh, attending to the environment by strengthening the cosmovision of the Yonomami. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so for me, well, it was very important to share, like, uh, like the argument that Copenhagen made about, you know, maybe if we share our wisdom with people out there, they will stop killing the Yanomami and killing the forest. So I felt that uh, he was speaking to me and saying, if you have the chance to share the stories in a place like Harvard, do it. <laughs> so for me, it's about sharing, uh, informing people about, about uh, you know, what indigenous peoples are doing to protect the environment. Because the, the other thing is that it is just so incredible that even though we're speaking about indigenous peoples, but we don't know much about indigenous peoples, right? I don't know if I have time to offer an example of what you I do. You do. Okay. So in one of my classes, uh, I teach a, a class on, um, you know, uh, world indigenous literatures, right? And the first day of classes, I ask students, I, I do this activity, and I said to students, you know, why, why are you taking this class? And they, some of them tell me, yeah, it's a requirement. And what do you know about indigenous peoples? And I, I do the following activity. And I said, let's talk about entertainment. Let's talk about music. And uh, tell me about, you know, African-American artists. And immediately, Beyonce, Kanye, Kendrick Lamar, you know, all these names. Tell me about Latinx artists or, you know, entertainers. J-Lo, Ricky Martin, Shakira, you know, all these hands, right? Tell, tell me about indigenous entertainers. Complete silence. <laughs> and, uh, but it's just that knowledge is so um, absent, right? And so necessary. I mean, look at what we have to offer, right? And we offer solutions and, and we offer this wisdom that hopefully can help us better understand our relationship to that environment. So I think it's extremely crucial that uh, that, that knowledge uh, makes its way into, you know, uh, all the institutions, settler colonial institutions especially, but, you know, and hopefully people will learn from it and, and, and act on it. In Guatemala, mm -hmm. How has religious conversations to Christ, uh, about Christianity, if at all, impacted Mayan cultural perceptions and interactions in regard to, to their cosmovision? Um, so a lot of people like to talk about syncretism and uh, liberation theology uh, had a major impact in, in Mesoamerica. Uh, so it's like liberation theology, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's the combination of Marxism and Christianity rethinking the figure of Jesus as a, an activist right, that fought for the people, for the poor specifically. And so that area had a, a major impact. Uh, and uh, so, and a lot of people use that ideology like to, to connect it with Maya knowledge and, uh, and use it in order to, to affirm indigenous rights. But there are other, I mean, we have a lot of elders and leaders who are spreading the word, like using our own cosmovision in order to spread the word about indigenous rights and creation stories. So there are these competing narratives. Um, but, uh, you know, they make its way into, into people like me and, you know, we, like, oh, I didn't know about this, my, about, about this from my ancestors. And, and so I tried to, to learn more and, right. yeah. Um, again, on the religious aspects of this, um, of your topic, any thoughts about working with religious groups to protect the indigenous people and Mother Earth? Mm -hmm. Are conversations currently happening together? So, Copenhagen talks about some religious um, leaders that came into Yanomami territory and they were actually helpful. And I, I'm not trying to, to diminish some of that work that's been done. Uh, Hopefully, it can be uh, done in a respectful way. And, you know, like, let's say if there is a priest that uh, begins to learn about creation stories from the Yanomami, for that person to be respectful and to say, wow, you know, let's spread the word. Let, let me use the church to, to help you spread the word. <laughs> so that's one way. But, um, or, or, you know, like religious institutions also have a lot of funding and they can also support you know, indigenous communities are producing their own materials for language revitalization or like to continue spreading the, uh, uh, like talking about creation stories from indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. 
There is one uh, question about mining, so gold mining. Uh, what is the impact of um, the Yanomami phase today due to gold mining? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is this is important because it's sometimes we think, oh, you know, this is happening all the way in Brazil. It doesn't have anything to do with me. But we're using devices, right? And if we look at the story of those devices and where the materials uh, to put together these devices come from, you're going to find a lot of connections to, you know, the Amazonian region or if we eat meat, right? So it is important for us to, to be, become aware of how these resources that, that are being extracted from indigenous lands are being used in order to benefit not indigenous peoples, but, you know, people, um, for the most part, non-indigenous peoples. So I think in conclusion, why should an American audience worry or be concerned about the well-being of the Yanomami mm -hmm. uh, people in Amazonia? Like three reasons why we should not right. be concerned about them. If you don't like pandemics, if you don't like COVID, if you want to relieve that, <laughs> you have to be aware of what's going on in the Amazon. Um, you know, if, uh, if you want people to protect the environment, if you want to help that 5%, of the indigenous world population protecting the environment, you have to, to help out. You know, it's, if not, as David Kopenawa says in his book, the sky is going to fall again, and then the Shapiri spirits are going to escape, and then we're gonna be screwed. That's that way. And one final question. Protecting the earth is a very heavy burden, and indigenous peoples are paying a very high price. How do they and you keep motivated? Obviously, dancing, we said, it's one of the... <laughs> Meditation. <laughs> um, so it's um, usually um, the messages that are uh, given to us by indigenous leaders is like, you know, no matter what happens to us, you have to continue the fight. That's what I'm doing. Thank you, Emil. Thank you for your presentation and for your uh, you. perspective. Thank you. Thank you.